There is another Bronco in the Hall of Fame. I mean, sure, sure he was a cowboy too, but you know, he has a ring to compliment that orange, that yellow jacket, thanks to his time in orange and blue. We're claiming him. Former outside linebacker Demarcus Ware helped the Broncos to a Super Bowl win. Our Broncos insider Mike Kliss got to see the big moment from the crowd in Arizona, and you were able to talk to him right after the ceremony as well, Mike. I did. Yeah, he got most of his sacks with the Dallas Cowboys. Demarcus Ware did. He played nine years there. He played only three with the Denver Broncos. But as Demarcus showed uh, me and all the viewers out there, he has something nice and big and shiny that only the Broncos got him and not with the Cowboys. Vaughn is like my brother. I'm, I'm just going to start there. And to be able to come um, and mentor Vaughn and now him doing the same thing and going win that championship with the Rams and then try to do the same thing with Buffalo, it was like that little seed got planted and it's still living. Mm -hmm. And it's still going. And then he sent me a picture of his baby, just had his baby, so all, oh, okay. all of that. So yeah. um, it's, it's, it's an amazing relationship that we built, and it was so worth it. I was talking about uh, Vaughn Miller there. And uh, I tell you what, uh, Vaughn, uh, DeMarcus Ware goes in on his second ballot. What I remember, guys, that AFC championship game against the Patriots, he hit Tom Brady not once, not twice, but eight times in that AFC championship game. He was hurt, but he played excellent in that game. We have good memories. I think Tom Brady still remembers it, too. Thanks, Mike. A man killed his ex-girlfriend and her 16-year-old daughter with a gun that he was not supposed to have. Court ordered him to give up his weapons, but no one checked to see if he still had one. The victim's family wants to know why. Here's 9 News reporter Kelly Rinke. Two people are dead in Loveland after a man shot them and then took off to Erie. They said they were looking for a guy named Javier Acevedo, 49 years old. 660 Crimson Way, if you guys can get in there quick, he's getting close. That you is Javier Acevedo. Stop, stop We've stop, already stop, told stop. you what he did last summer, and now we're learning more about what didn't happen before the shooting. And that story starts with a phone call. My mother called me on the phone. I was like... My, I was at the scene within 20 minutes. Garen Dom got a call that something happened at his sister Lindsay's house, and it's something that he always knew could eventually come one day. In July of last year, Javier Acevedo went to his ex-girlfriend's house, Lindsay's house, and shot and killed her and her 16-year-old daughter, Meadow Center. That's your suspect. Uh, still holding the rifle, still holding the magazine. The footage we got from the Loveland Police Department really shows just how chaotic that day was. If you do not comply with command, force me to use the gun shoot. Police are scrambling, and they eventually find Javier Acevedo in Erie, and he is holding the gun that he used to kill Lindsay and Meadow that day. He ends up killing himself, too. It's like your entire life starts over on this day, you know, everything, it, it changes everything. We know that he purchased the gun he used to kill Lindsay and Meadow a few months before a court required him to give up his guns. They could have gotten that gun, you know. He should have had to physically relinquish that gun. Acevedo's ex-wife asked a Denver County court to grant her a criminal protection order, and that's what they did. And as a part of that, they required Acevedo to give up any guns he had at the time. On the firearm relinquishment form, you can see that Javier Acevedo checked a box saying he did not possess a gun at the time. We know that he purchased the gun a few months before he signed a piece of paper saying he had to relinquish any firearms he had. You just take his word for it? No, absolutely not. You couldn't take this person's word for anything. The guy was a compulsive liar. What do you think he intended when he bought that shotgun? That's what I think about more than anything now. This case was handled by the Denver City Attorney's Office, and that office said they don't have a role in verifying the truthfulness of what's said on a firearm relinquishment form. Basically, they just don't check. But unless someone is to say that you are lying on that form or committing perjury, there is no way to really enforce that. Katie Wolf is the public policy director for Violence Free Colorado, and she really gets this stuff because she works with lawmakers in our state on bills related to domestic violence. Denver sees about 20, more than 2,500 domestic violence cases at the municipal level every year. 
And so it'd be really hard and a lot of resources for them to be able to investigate every single relinqu relinquishment form. Garen was really upset that no one checked and he thinks that that should change. They're just like, oh, here, sign here. Oh, you're already in enough trouble. Here, just check this little box to say you don't have any guns. How easy would it have been to find out that he had purchased that firearm? Katie knows that we can't create a database like that because our state constitution makes it illegal. It would be a lot easier if there were a way to just check to see if people had guns, if there was a database where people's names were listed. Um, the Colorado Constitution prohibits that from happening. Lindsay went to a Larimer County court twice asking for a protection order against Acevedo and both times a judge denied her request saying there just wasn't enough evidence. In one of those requests she said Acevedo threatened to kill her. When she was denied the protection order the second time it was just a month before Acevedo killed her. Feeling even remotely like that was enough is the biggest thing for me. I feel so I mean that's just the guilt that I deal with like every single day. Garen was incredibly upset. He felt like he put too much trust and faith in a system that was supposed to protect his sister. You always are going to feel like there's so much more you could have done, but I mean, I, I really, I mean, I feel like a total sucker. He had a lot of hesitancies talking about his sister's case. But because there were so many warning signs, he felt it was important to talk about really the worst day of his life. Um, it's hard for me to, you know, look back and think about things like, well, like Meadow, for example, you know, and look at that picture and go, oh, it's hard for me to remember. Oh yeah, I remember she was such a happy kid, you know, and things like that. It's, that stuff is really hard to even fathom now. On the day that Lizzie Dom and Meadow Center were killed, the 16-year-old had just finished her internship with the Colorado Youth Congress. People need to hear this, and people need to know, yeah, this is the, this is the state you live in. Two times, a woman in Loveland asked a judge to make her ex-boyfriend give up his guns and stay away from her home. Now, the Denver District Attorney's Office, which handles misdemeanor and felony charges, has a firearm relinquishment investigator. They focus primarily on domestic violence cases, and they even check those forms when defendants say they don't have a gun. They say they are the only jurisdiction in Colorado with this type of investigator. The city attorney's office says they don't have an investigator like this because they handle municipal cases, and that doesn't trigger the federal law that prohibits someone from having the gun. But there are so many of those. 2,500. More than 2,500 is what Katie is saying. It's a lot to handle. Yeah, and, and I mean, for a family to have tried to do everything that they could, to have asked for help, to put the warning signs out there, and for, thing, for them to be failed is just so heartbreaking. Yeah, and so that's what the family is saying, too. Like, what else was Lindsay supposed to do? Yeah. Like, she had filed those forms, and ex-wife had filed those forms. It's just, I think the family just kind of feels helpless, and that's why they feel that this needs to be checked. Um, that firearm relinquishment investigator down in, um, or here in, in uh, the Denver District Attorney's Office, just started very recently. And mm -hmm. just from this past year, they've already relinquished more than 100 firearms in about 50 cases. But again, that's super rare. We don't see that anywhere else in Colorado. Yeah, they did everything right and still it wasn't enough. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. A court case out of Texas could have ripple effects on abortion providers all the way here in Colorado. An anti-abortion group, including some doctors, sued the FDA in federal court, trying to overturn the FDA's approval of mifepristone. It's used as a second drug to terminate an early pregnancy in the U.S., known to most as the abortion pill. It can also be used to manage miscarriages. The FDA approved that drug more than 20 years ago. If mifepristone gets pulled off the market now, it would change abortion options around the country, even in states like Colorado where abortion is fully legal. Problem is, even in states like ours, you are guaranteed access to abortion. You are not guaranteed a method. We are preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. We're a state that respects abortion rights. We want people to be able to access it. We'll figure out a way to help them do it. Um, it'll just be more complicated. The judge deciding this case was appointed by President Donald Trump. It's a common strategy for federal plaintiffs to file in a sympathetic court, in this case before a conservative judge in Texas. Leaders in Douglas County are celebrating, saying that they have reduced the number of people experiencing homelessness in their county. Part of their strategy includes trucking people out of the county. County leaders shared the first numbers from a point in time count for Douglas County. It's a tally of the number of people on the streets or in shelters at any one given night. So they found 27 people experiencing homelessness on January 30th. That's down from 50 people in January of 2022. 
Republican County Commissioner Abe Layden credits the change to their new Homeless Engagement Assistance Resource Team, HART. That group helps law enforcement respond to calls about people experiencing homelessness. Since the HART team was created in October, they have transported 24 people to sober living homes or shelters, all outside Douglas County. Colorado's only oil refinery is about to start running again after a six week shutdown. The Suncor refinery in Commerce City closed at the end of December after two fires and damage from extreme cold. The company says repairs are done at one of these three plants and it's going to reopen next week. Suncor says the entire facility probably won't be running again until March.